Okay, colleagues, let me talk about everything at the same time. The meaning of life, the purpose of the universe, everything, everything, everything. Now, the, the immediate occasion for me talking about this is wonderful presentation by Zale and Mitri last time, the presentation about Heidegger and Buddha. Such a wonderfully productive dialogue. Well, yeah. No, it was Lev, yes, I'm sorry, yeah, Zale and Lev, yeah, about Heidegger, Heidegger and Buddha. Uh, uh, such a wonderfully productive dialogue, so we bring everything uh, 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 together in the same package. Uh, uh, Nikolai, my physicist friend from Vienna, always tells me that I shouldn't talk while the bell is ringing. Let's you know, kind of get into the meditative mood. So, these are the topics on the board. I'm going to try to explore them. Whew, starting from somewhere. So again, so it's like, uh, is Heidegger really influenced by Buddhism? Is Heidegger a Buddhist at, at heart? I'm not sure. This is my way of productively engaging with the same, you know, with, with their ideas. It's like, uh, to me, it's like I treat Buddhism and Buddha as, as the same way I treat Epicurus or Socrates, right? It's, it's, it's a certain kind of philosophy to me, right? Uh, philosophy which has productive ideas. Of course, obviously, Buddha never wrote anything. Socrates also never wrote anything. So it's like, when I talk about the Buddha, in many ways, I, I'm talking about the interpretation of Buddha by philosophers such as Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu. Anyway, so uh, let me start somewhere. So the first productive point of contact between uh, Buddha and Heidegger, and it's like, again, why are we talking about this? Because we are exploring the, uh, we are exploring the naturalist worldview. Uh, again, Sean Carroll has this wonderful phrase, poetic naturalism. And I feel that maybe, maybe, you know, we can uh, uh, um, enlarge, enlighten, expand naturalism, elevate naturalism by appeal to Heidegger. So the first question is the question of ontology. What exists? And Heidegger has this wonderful way of talking about being, how being with capital B exists as opposed to small b beings, particular individual objects of experience. Like this, this marker maybe exists in some sense as an object of my experience or something like that, but also like being exists as a whole. And uh, uh, some people have a connotation of maybe, you know, so when you talk about being as a whole, do you mean the universe? Do you mean God? And, and Heidegger has something of, of those connotations, although uh, 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 it's like, let me, let, me, let me first quote Sean Carroll and then talk about religion. Carroll has a wonderfully beautiful Spinozistic Hegelian, but also I think a very Heideggerian phrase. He says he is a reality realist. Sean Carroll says he's a reality realist. So he says that re reality is real in a way nothing else is real. Like it's in a category of its own. It has a more fundamental, more, like it has more reality than anything else. And Carroll says that we, again, it's like presumably we have our own perceptions or models, like the Schrodinger equation, for example. Maybe it's a useful way of talking about reality, but what we, th like at the end of the day, only reality in its totality is real. And again, it's like you should hear an echo of Hegel when I say this. Um, so in this sense, in this sense, it's like Heidegger, We'll talk about how there's a fundamental mystery of being. Being is this ungraspable whole, which is larger than anything. And so I want to, again, I want to, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'll be able to explain this, but let me at least allude to three ideas which I think are related. So this Heidegger's notion of the mystery of being, um, Carroll's idea of what he calls, again, reality realism, and, well, apophatic tradition in theology. Because I feel that, uh, uh, it's like, again, I'm going to talk later about hermeneutics of trust and suspicion. I feel that we should never trust any text completely, including religious texts. But we should also never dismiss any text completely. And especially the greatest texts of the Western religious tradition, I'm going to talk uh, uh, on Wednesday about Tao Te Ching. Uh, 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 it's like, I feel we, we can learn from everything, from, uh, from Torah, from the Quran, and from the Rig Veda. It's wonderful, because there's always something to learn everywhere. Right? And so the, the, the deep theologians, people like Ibn Ru, in the Muslim tradition, or maybe Philo or Maimonides in the Jewish tradition, or um, you know, you can, we can continue, or pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite in the Christian tradition, right? Uh, uh, they have this understanding that God is beyond description, that the fundamental aspect of reality, the fundamental principle of reality, has to be beyond words, beyond description. In this sense, it's kind of an interesting question. Thomas Hobbes was Hobbes an atheist, or is he just an apathetic theologian? Hobbes insists that you cannot say anything meaningful, and Kant would agree with Hobbes. You cannot say 
say anything meaningful about God. In fact, if you say that God is conscious, if you say that God cares about you, if you say that God loves you, or if you say that God, wonderful example I always give, if you say that God cares about what food you eat and how you prepare it, or uh, whom do you have sex with and in which positions, you are simply being blasphemous. And I feel that this is a Heideggerian thought. Heidegger is deeply uh, attentive to this way of putting things together. So this is so ap apophatic. So apoph this cataphatic theology, positive theology, which tries to describe God, and apophatic theology, which always talks in the negative, in the negative. Like, God does not exist. God is beyond existence. God is not good. God is beyond goodness. God is not conscious. God is beyond consciousness. Hmm, God is not good or evil. God is beyond good and evil. This is the proper apophatic way of talking about things. And again, it's an age-old tradition. In fact, what, what is God? Does God even exist? I mean, Buddhism supposedly is an atheistic religion, but again, it's like if, if, you, if, you, if you describe the ultimate principle of the universe in such terms, maybe there's an interesting uh, parallel to be drawn. Again, it's a wonderful quote from Rig Veda, which talks about how, what existed in the beginning? The gods were not yet born. Who knows? Does, does, he, does Brahma even know wh uh, where, where the universe comes from? The, you know, in the Rig Veda, in that particular verse, the chief divinity. And I feel, I feel again, I feel sort of, to, it's like, hmm, to, to, uh, very often, people in, in the, sci the scientists are accused of being like um, anthropocentric, um, superstitious, like, oh, they believe that everything is formulas. Yeah, yeah, you, it's like, mm -hmm. this is Heideggerian criticism of scientism. Heideggerian criticism of scientism. This is, this is Heideggerian criticism of some of the words that I say in this course. So, you know, Lagrangian of standard model of particle physics, that's just one description. Reality has to be beyond that. We have to be open to the mystery, to the mystery of being. And if we are not open to the mystery of being, if we think that the universe is just a simple formula, or if we think that the universe is just, you know, some bearded guy sitting on a cloud, then we're being uh, so, so we're being superstitious, idolatrous, and blasphemous, I feel. This is what Heidegger would say. Uh, superstitious, anthropomorphic, I, and therefore idolatrous, and therefore blasphemous. Uh, 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 I should say, it's like, take everything I say with a grain of salt. It's a, you know, I'm being slightly, slightly pretentious, maybe like slightly more controversial than I want to for like pedagogical reasons, okay? Like, oh, um, with a question mark, with a question mark. This is the apophatic tradition in, 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 in theology. This is my way of explaining what Heidegger means by being, right? So, and again, it's like, I feel that Sean Carroll at bottom is, is at, at, on board with this picture. Even though, as far as I know, Carroll has never read Spinoza, never read Hegel, never read Heidegger, but he arrives at the same conclusions by different means, which is why it's wonderful. Again, I keep talking about how mechanistic, we, we, tra we transition from teleological to mechanistic worldview, and there's this uh, um, co confluence, there's this um unity of the two approaches, the mechanistic biological approach from people like Sean Carroll and the you know, humanities approach from people like uh, Hobbes and Hume and, and maybe even Kant to some extent, but especially people like Nietzsche and Heidegger. So Nietzsche and Heidegger seem to, I, I think, agree with contemporary uh, uh, um, you know, anthropology, evolutionary psychology for different reasons. Anyway, so this is, this is, this is my way of talking about ontology. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I could, I, could say, I could say a lot more, but again, this basic idea that we should not confuse our limited perception of reality with reality itself. If we confuse our limited perception of reality with reality in itself, we are, again, forgive, forgive this slightly controversial phrase, again, a slightly overblown phrase. If we confuse the way, we, the way things appear to us with the way things really are in Kantian language, confuse phenomena with the noumena, right? We are being, again, apologies, blasphemous, idolatrous, anthropocentric. Mm -hmm. Like, we should, we should always be aware uh, to, to the possibility that, you know, it's like, again, as Socrates says, human mind is limited. Uh, and we, we always, we, didn't, we never see the world as it really is. We always see the world from our limited perspective, which is necessarily fallible, because human beings are prone to error. Anyway, not to mention prone to deceit. Um, so this is, this is my talking about ontology. Now, when we talk about Buddhism, hmm, I, I have left myself no time to talk about Buddhism. Let me not talk about Buddhism. But there's this wonderful, again, Nagarjuna, the Madhyamaka school. The, the, things neither exist nor do they not exist. They neither exist nor do they not exist. And I feel it's a very beautiful phrase, a very beautiful formulation, right? So it's like mm, uh, this world is the world of becoming. It's the world of becoming in terms of our you know, phenomena, of our perception. This is my way of reading Nagarjuna. So it's not like this marker is like really real, but it's also not entirely unreal. And I feel that, again, it's like I'm, I, I haven't left myself time to explain this, so maybe in a future video I'll talk about this at some point. But that's, you know, I feel, I feel that there's a deep connection between, again, what 
what Heidegger talks about in, in terms of being, and what, again, for example, the way Nagarjuna explains uh, 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 Buddhism, how we shouldn't, we shouldn't be, you know, hmm? Buddhism is about not being attached, also not being attached to our understanding of reality. The oversimplified way of looking at it is that remember, remember, for both Heidegger and for the Buddha, remember that you are not seeing reality as it really, really is, but you are seeing a certain illusion, a perception of your mind, which is limited and, and fallible. Whew. Now, all of this, all of this uh, uh, has to necessarily, and again, it's like for both uh, uh, Heidegger and for, for the Buddha, the stakes are ethical. The stakes are ethical. How do we understand ourselves? How do we understand the meaning and purpose of existence? And what do we do with our lives? Right? And I feel that in general, in the uh, most, uh, in the deepest traditions, uh, everywhere, in the West, in the East, in uh, Tao Te Ching, in um, Descartes, in Socrates, in Epicurus, in Buddhism, everywhere, uh, ethics is always the fruit of the tree. This is why we do philosophy. Philosophy is a practical enterprise that should inform our life. Again, in many ways, Buddha says you wake up in the morning and you find dukkha, dukkha. Life is unsatisfactory. Life is always an issue for us, says Buddha, and Heidegger agrees. Life is always an issue for us. We're anxious beings thrown into this world without a manual. Or, you know, we come from not sure where. We're thrown into this world, the Befindlichkeit. And, and we were not sure where we're moving in the future. And so this groundlessness in the past, anxiety about the future. Uh, this is what Heidegger says, and Buddha, I feel, is very attentive to these uh, sorts of issues. And again, in both Buddhism and in Heidegger, I feel that the solution is not really lasting meaning, finding me transcendental meaning or lasting satisfaction in life, but the solution is to make life slightly more palatable. Buddha would say reduce suffering. I mean, that's what nirvana is. You get rid of desire to not suffer. And in doing so, you find a certain interesting poetic way of looking at the world. Solution you know, a, a po poetic way of looking at the world. Maybe, maybe I should erase this because uh, I talked about this already. And let's let, let me let me let me let me introduce a couple more names. So, in ethical terms, three names. Three names again: uh, Heraclitus, uh, Lao Tzu, and Buddha. Heraclitus of Ephesus, the ancient Greek philosopher. Lao Tzu and uh, Buddha. Right. And so Heraclitus has this wonderful phrase. He says. Um, only humans, from their limited perspective, say that things are good or evil. But to the divinity, is, it, is there one God or many? Is God conscious or not? He doesn't specify. Totheon is Greek. It's, uh, uh, it's impersonal, divinity. To the divinity, all things are good and just and beautiful. Even children rotting in their grave, right, so who have died from cancer. Still, uh, all the genocides and the rapes, everything is beautiful, says, says Heraclitus. Now, uh, Lao Tse, I'm going to embarrass myself live on camera. I, th I hope this is how you write Lao Tse. Uh, uh, um, so, just to be on the safe side, let me erase this. So, Lao Tse says, mm -hmm, heaven and earth, presumably meaning the universe, are not humane. Heaven and earth are not humane. Uh, the, uh, this is Ren in, uh, 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 in, in Chinese, right? Uh, he heaven and earth are not hu humane. F for to, to heaven and earth, everything, humans and animals, are simply straw dogs. Toys, toys. Mm -hmm. So again, and notice, I want to say that in Heraclitus and in Lao Tse, this is maybe the most important insight of the mechanistic picture. Again, on the mechanistic picture, mm, humanity is just a random, uh, all of our conscious life is just a random byproduct of converting CO2 into CH4. You know, and Heraclitus and Lao Tse, in some sense, would agree. Again, it's like in the grand scheme of things, human life is not w worth much. And again, sort of, again, Buddha, s somewhat, somewhat similar, I, th I feel, way. And, in Heraclitus and in Lao Tzu especially, uh, and this is the way Buddhism was interpreted, especially when it came to China, because Buddhism and Taoism were actually interpreted together. And uh, Heidegger presumably was interested in Zen Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism actually combines insights from both uh, Lao Tzu and, and, and uh, Buddha. So the, uh, the word is Wu Wei. I cannot write this in, uh, uh, in uh, hieroglyphics. It's something like this, uh, but, I, but, I'm, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not, the, the, the Hanze are not entirely correct, but it's like Wu Wei is letting go, is letting go. Mm. It's a inter kind of contemplative attitude to life. Ah, Pythagoreans, you remember last year, uh, the Pythagoreans say that there are three kinds of people who come to the Olympic Games. People who come to, for, for, for gain, because they want to sell something, for honor, because they want to compete, and then there are people who come to spectate. Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas says, become passerby, become passerby, a detached, contemplative view of the world. Nietzsche, this is Nietzsche in The Birth of Tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's like we, 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 we look at our lives as if this life is drama, 
it's not really real, we're just spectators. Mm. It's detachment and contemplation. Being, being, and again, op being open to the mystery of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel, I feel there's something to that. Again, am I saying that these philosophies are identical? No, no, but I feel that there's an interesting and productive dialogue, right? So this is, this is in many ways, this is, this is the ethical project of, be, of becoming happy, not by, uh, again, as Heidegger together with um, Marx and um, Weber is really, uh, you know, anxious about this drive of efficiency for the sake of efficiency, and how we turn everything into a resource to be used, to be used efficiently, including ourselves. We dominate ourselves, and in the process become unhappy, says Heidegger, Weber, and, and Marx. Right? And this is again not our fault at the end of the day because it's a structural process, especially for Marx. Again, coercive laws of market competitions, effic efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Right? Uh, uh, but the point for Heidegger is to learn to let go. Learn to be again attentive, and maybe, maybe even have a poetic attitude towards technology. To see technology as maybe works of art. Again, in Heidegger's cue was uh, Hölderlin, the, the, the German, the great German poet. Anyway, so uh, uh, um, uh, and I mean, um, I'm talking about everything at the same time. But let me let me tr let me try to continue talking about everything at the same time. It's like uh, uh, Heidegger talks about this destruction of uh, uh, Western metaphysics, destruction of me Western metaphysics, and uh, uh, De Jacques Derrida is later going to talk about the deconstruction of Western metaphysics. What is deconstruction? Well, it's a complicated term, but in some ways, deconstruction is trying to use language against itself because our, our it's like we 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 want to use language to point to limits of language. Uh -huh. So I, I use language, which operates with representations, to tell you that language is limited and we cannot know things and there's reality beyond that potentially is unknowable. And I feel that this is, this is deconstruction in you know, uh, the original interpretation of Heidegger. Uh, the Buddhists would call this upaya, upaya, skillful means. This is, you're, you're using imperfect analogies, imperfect metaphors, which are not literally true, but they're pedagogical devices which help people you know, move in the right direction. I'm not explaining this very well, and I won't necessarily, but so, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, uh, let me pause here. So uh -huh, yeah, when I talk about ethics, I also want to talk about this other stuff, but I'll get, I'll get there in a second. Um, so also, to be super brief about this, so we also mentioned this, this body of ideas, mind-body, uh, dualism, uh, 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 freedom, and selfhood. And I feel, again, between Heidegger and the Buddhist tradition, there's a space for a deeply productive dialogue between the two, right? Uh, um, Mind-body dualism is supposed to be a, a deep illusion. Human cognition is embodied. Mo many things that we do are unconscious in life. It's like you know, your body takes over. I feel Heidegger, like Freud, is uh, very attentive to that. There's a, a wonderful German, oh, sorry, French philosopher, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who's supposed to be all about uh, taking Heideggerian insights to talk about the human body. And again, how, how this perception of mind-body dualism is actually misperception, is an illusion, illusion of language. Uh, and again, I feel in a similar fashion, in Buddhism it's the same. It's like uh, you're trying to overcome this mind-body dualism, to see that you know, uh, mind is a continuation of body, body is a continuation of mind. In fact, these are two, of the, of two different descriptions of the same fundamental reality, which is one. Um, Freedom. There's no freedom for Heidegger or for Buddhism. I feel it's like oversimplification, but in one second, in one sentence, yes, we are products of larger than our, something larger than ourselves. We inherit from the past. Again, this Befindlichkeit in Heidegger, karma in uh, uh, in Buddhism, this conditioned arising, dependent arising. Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe according to something like these external uh, mechanistic laws and selfhood also in an important sense. We have to realize that there is no self, and uh, you know, Buddhism is supposed to, you're supposed to do this through meditation. But like, and, and there, there are layers of understanding what it means that there is no self. But the simplest, the most uh, superficial layer of understanding this is that human beings have, you know, human body has a way of telling a story in which you are the main character. But this story is not literally true. You are so much more than this story. In fact, human beings are, you know, products of larger forces. We're nodes in the unfolding of this great process. It's like Heidegger would say that we are Lichtung. We are, we are. A clearing through which being shines, right? We are not kind of substantial. We're not these immortal souls trapped in immortal bodies. And I feel for, for, for Buddhism it's the same, but especially like in terms of meditation, seeing, or in terms of this Wu Wei, this uh, insight from Lao Tzu, seeing how it's not like you perform actions, but like your body does actions and you are a spectator from within your own head. So all these ideas come together. I haven't been able to explain this uh, uh, in great detail, but uh, um, that's kind of the um, the rundown. I also want to talk about hermeneutics of trust and suspicion, but maybe maybe I should pause before we continue on there.